So I first heard about Local First about three months ago when I was signing up for this conference. And I'd heard about Offline First maybe two or three years ago. And when I looked up the, the, the meaning of these terms, I discovered that I'd been doing it for about 10 years. And every product I'd shipped for the last 10 years has been Local First. And I even sell a product commercially to developers to do Local First on the Mac. So how can this possibly be? How could, how, could, uh, how, could, how could this come about? We have to go way back to when I started developing shareware in the early 2000s. So at that time, there, were no, there was no mobile. It was just, uh, just PCs and Macs. And I started doing it as a hobby. I developed the apps uh, for the Mac in my spare time. And back then, it was just local. There was, there was no problem to solve because all the data was there on your, on your Mac or your PC, right? And there, there were very few people that had two of them. So uh, it was not really a problem. Uh, you didn't, data synchronization was not a problem to, you had to, had to deal with. That changed, of course, uh, around 2006, 7, uh, when Palm Pilots came out, when iPhone, Android came along. All of a sudden, we were in a different world. There was, there was now a world in which everyone had more than one device. You might have a, an iPhone, uh, a Mac, an iPad, uh, Android, PC, whatever. For an indie developer like me, making shareware, not earning a lot of money, and uh, being, being particularly uh, focused on uh, native apps, this was a problem, right? How am I going to make my app work across iPhone and Mac uh, at the same time without blowing the budget or getting a team to do it? Now, around this time, cloud came up as well. Oh, you can barely see that. There's a cloud there. Um, <laughs> S3 came up. Uh, and then they built on top of that, of course, Dropbox, which is a, you know, a folder that, that basically syncs up your files between devices. And people started to expect more as well from apps. They, expect, they, need, they wanted to see that apps, they just expected that apps would sync automatically. Um, and this, again, was a problem for someone who was an indie and didn't have a lot of, uh, a lot of cash to, to go around. So what was I going to do? Well, at this time, I saw my first local first system. And it didn't come from uh, open source. It wasn't from GitHub or anything like that. I'm not even sure if GitHub existed back then. This is, I'm talking around 2012. Um, it came from a very unexpected place. It came from, from Apple. The first iCloud sync that Apple introduced was actually a local first system. And they weren't advertising that, of course. That, that was an implementation detail. But people were reverse engineering what they were doing, and they were discovering, OK, this, this is how it works, and it's basically local first. Even though we didn't have the term back then, that, that's what it amounted to. So I'll explain why Apple did that. They introduced iCloud, and the iCloud was uh, a way, it was a clone of Dropbox. It was a way to take a folder of files from your Mac and just simply clone them across to your iPhone, and, and, and it would sync between the two of them. Um, they had done that, but they had another problem. That they had another system, which is called Core Data. And Core Data was basically a SQL database, a SQLite database on each device. And a lot of developers were using this. So um, you've got a SQLite database on your Mac and a SQLite database on your iPhone and your iPad. How are you going to sync this up? And that's not a particularly easy thing to do. So what they did is they, they built a local first system. They, they captured the logs, you know, the saved logs from, from SQL, and they put them as flat files into uh, iCloud, and iCloud moved them over to the other device, and they read them back in. And of course, there's a lot of uh, administration. That sounds very easy, but it, there's a lot of administration and corner cases and things, uh, things that can go wrong when you do that. But it was the first local first system that I saw. Unfortunately, it was also terrible. Uh, I tried to using this thing for three or four months in my software. I thought, this is the solution, and it wasn't the solution. It was really bad. Um, like I said, there are a lot of corner cases, as, and I heard later on that Apple actually only had one engineer on this. So <laughs> some poor dude some poor dude had to solve all these problems, uh, and probably under enormous time pressure as well. 
uh, it, didn't, it didn't work out, but it did plant the seed of the, you know, the idea that you could make a system like this and even sync, you know, syncing databases fear flat files. And uh, at this point, I did what you should never do, and I, I built my own, right? Just reinvented the wheel. I just took what I learned from all of, the, all of Apple's mistakes. Basically, I knew, the, knew their system inside out. And I... Um, came up with solutions to their mistakes, and I built something called Ensembles, which is it's basically the same system. Um, um, and I wanted to go a little bit further than Apple, even, because Apple, of course, aren't going to use iCloud. I wanted to make, make it so that I could use any back-end. Um, I call that back-end back -end agnostic. We've heard that, that term. Uh, we talk about local first, but this is, in my head, what, what local first is. It's, it's like you can change to another back-end any time you want. Right? That's, that's my idea of, of local first. You're not locked in to a system. Um, so that's, that's my idea. I, when, I, when I ship an app these days, I often support multiple of these. So I've got Web Dev, uh, Dropbox, iCloud. I can literally switch between them with one line of code. Um, and I often support multiple uh, sync engines for, in one app so that people can just choose. I want Dropbox, I want iCloud. And that, that comes from lo being local first using that local-first system. I mentioned that Apple made a, a few mistakes. Um, one, thing, one, one thing I realized quite early on, I, I delved deep into the, into the, um, you know, the, the decentral uh, data systems. This is back quite a long time ago, so 2012, so there wasn't a lot around, but there was enough to, to figure out I needed, I needed a good system, and I, came, I, I used vector clocks throughout, so vector clocks, uh, Basically, when you save some data, you save a, a timestamp, uh, basically the state of all of the different devices that you know about. And that way, when you have two, two events, two saves, you can say, OK, which one came first? Um, are they conflicting? Did they happen at the same time, approximately? Are they concurrent changes? So just using a, a vector clock enables you to detect a lot of these problems. And as an example, say, say, that, you're, say that you're missing this green one, Say that this is an event, a save event, and you're missing it. Um, with the vector clock, you can see that. You can see, okay, I've got these blue ones, but they, there's a gap, right? There's, I'm missing a prerequisite. And at that point, the system can say, okay, well, in that case, we can't, we can't import the blue one um, because that's, that's all, there's no prerequisite for those. So we'll wait until the green one turns up. And you need this sort of system in place when you're working with very unreliable uh, sort of tra you know, uh, communication, like Dropbox or like iCloud, because you're putting files in, but there's no guarantee that they'll all make it across. There's no guarantee about the order that they make it across, so you could be getting newer files appear before the old ones have appeared. So you really need uh, a, an administration to see, you know, with the vector clock, you can say, okay, this is the correct order, and, um, and that's... That's the way it needs to work. And there's one nice thing about uh, ensembles, which I actually haven't seen in another system, so I'll leave this as a sort of a, an Easter egg. Um, one thing I put built in from the beginning, because most apps have a lot of churn, um, I wanted it to be able to clean up, to do sort of like a garbage collection. On the, because if you keep just adding more and more data, of course, you, eventually, you can you end up with a lot of data. Uh, this is a sort of a problem in CRDT sometimes, that you just, you just build up history and you never clean it up. I built that in from the beginning, so I call that baseline propagation. And basically, uh, ensembles can sort of clean up your old data. It takes away red redundancy, so if you've been changing a particular thing over and over, it'll just keep the last one and throw away all the rest. And if you've deleted an object completely, well, we can just throw that away as well. Now that, of course, this, this is not something you do um, carelessly. You have to be careful about how long ago you, you, in the history you do this. But it's been, it's been shipping for 10 years, still available now, and uh, there's hundreds of apps running on this with, this with this baseline propagation. So it does work. So this is some, maybe something that, that could be added in the future to, uh, to other systems. So that's all I've got time for. Um, thanks, for thanks for listening. And, um, I'm, I'm really glad that there's actually now a, a word, local first. So th thanks to the people that have invented a word um, so that we can have a conference and talk about it.